Thank you, robot lady. <laughs> All right, so we have three speakers today. Talks will be right about 20 minutes long with 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, we have a 90 minute event, so that leaves us like negative margin to get through three talks and three sets of Q&A. Um, so do try to hold your questions to the end for this, uh, for this format. Um, and then for Q&A, feel free to like use the Zoom chat as Boris said, and there tends to be, I usually have to remind this group, this group tends to be pretty chatty in the Zoom chat. Um, I'll try to stay on top of those and respond to some of those. And then at the end, um, you can just unmute yourself and ask questions during the Q&A series and ask them out loud. We don't have any kind of platform for Q&A. Um, yeah, so without that, with that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do a real brief introductions of each one of our speakers to really give them the time to talk about what they're thinking about, what they're working on, um, and uh, that way we can get to the Q&A. So first up will be Linus, uh, followed by Kevin and Raphael. Linus Lee is a writer and software engineer. He's working on a variety of things, but he's thinking about opportunities in education, technology, and community. He has well over 100 side projects that he's worked on listed on his website. So it, uh, it's a, a fun place to go explore all of the things that Linus has externalized from his brain and put out on the interwebs. Um, and today he's going to be talking about one of those side projects that he's that he's been working on and maybe some others as well. He's currently working at a company called Ideaflow, um, where they are building a tool for thought. Um, so without further ado, uh, Linus, I'll turn over the time to you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so sadly this week I have a bit of a cold, so I have like two things full of tea in front of me and hopefully it'll, I don't sound too terrible, but um, we're just going to roll with it and uh bear with me all right let's start Am I, the i have a demo coming up and the demo is building in another tab as i'm speaking and so hopefully it'll be it'll be done building by the time i get to it but yeah so i'm here to talk about sailing the semantic seas so to speak here's my handle and stuff if you want to look me up or talk more about these things but uh yeah let's dive in so itinerary uh i want to begin with a mystery talk about an idea that i had a tool that i built and then maybe make some predictions before we leave. The mystery is about this island called Bovin Island. Um, this is, there's really not a lot, lot of great important reason I'm talking about it here, except for the fact that I think this is just a really interesting mystery. Um, the Bovin Island, uh, to keep it short, is, is kind of an island right here in the Southern Ocean, basically in the middle of nowhere, about as middle of nowhere as you could get. According to a blog post that I can link later about Bovin Island, uh, it lies in the furthest reaches of Stormwreck's Southern Ocean, far south even of the Roaring Forties. It's a speck of ice in the middle of freezing fastness, a few square miles of uninhabited volcanic basalt groaning under several hundred feet of glacier, scraped raw by gales, shrouded by drifts of sea fog and utterly devoid of trees, shelter, or landing places. It's, it's really this tiny uh, slab of rock covered in snow and ice. It's like stormy most of the year, very hard to approach, even for experienced sailors. And uh, this island has, has quite a history. Um, and one of my favorite things about it is there's this mystery associated with it, with it that you may or may not have heard about where uh, because it's so remote, most sort of sailing paths that normal humans go on never really go near this island. So you only ever really see this island if you're like going straight towards it or if you're like, you know, holding onto wreckage and like your boat uh, happens to, you know, get pulled into a current nearby. And so, it wasn't really until the early uh, sort of mid 20th century when humans actually started sort of discovering this island. And, um, and there are some expeditions that, that went here, some science expeditions, and then there was a big gap during the World Wars um, where people never didn't, didn't really go to the island. And during one of the gaps, um, there were, we have no record of humans ever visiting the island, but the subsequent exploration found a wreckage of sort of a small boat and some sheets of metal on the island. And so uh, the, the big mystery of the island is, you know, who could have possibly attempted to settle this island or been wrecked on this island? Um, and, uh, and nobody really knows. It's still kind of an open mystery. And because it's so hard to approach, it's hard to do any kind of like, you know, science or study there. It's, uh, this is one of the rare kind of clear days of satellite imagery that we have, but normally it's kind of covered under a lot of cloud cover and, and things like that. So it's, it's a really fascinating place that I've, uh, I have a thing for kind of remote places. So this is one of my favorite stories to talk about. Um, but the, the bit that's relevant here to our, our talk today is, uh, it's not really this particular island, 
uh, it's just my favorite island. But in general, I think if you if you're dropped into the world as a human, it's kind of like you're like lost at sea in this kind of sea of knowledge and information. There's a lot of knowledge that's just like coming at you, crashing into you, and uh, you're just kind of stuck in this little island trying to make sense of it all. And you're you're trying to get home, and you're trying to like trying to explore, but uh, you're just kind of lost at sea, and your only hope really. Is, is sort of the basic tools you're, you're given initially. It's your brain, some, some written language, some books, um, and uh, maybe like a paper or journal. And we're all just set adrift in this ocean with only the basic tools of survival, the basic tools for thought. And I think our responsibility in this sort of generation of tool building and, and ideation is to try to build better boats, better navigation tools, better aids. And so to get home safe or to explore the ocean, we need some, some practices and some tools to guide us through this expedition. Um, and so the, the first kind of practice that I wanna talk about is this thing that I call incremental note-taking, which is an idea that I, I sort of formalized and shared a couple of weeks ago that seemed to resonate with some people or at least spark some interesting discussion. And the basic idea is that note-taking, uh, we approach note-taking less like um, a gardening task that I think a lot of people sort of gravitate towards, but more like a captain's log uh, that's a little more kind of dated and chronological. And um, the big idea here is that good notes should behave like a memory. Uh, and, and here there's a bit of a, a blog post that I've snipped here that actually references one of Jess's writings. But the idea is that um, when, when you learn something or when you come upon something new or when you have a discussion that you want to remember, uh, it doesn't happen in a void. It doesn't happen just as like a semantic island in the middle of your brain it has context. It has like when you had that experience, at what location you had that experience, who you talked to, it has, you know, what you were doing then. Um, and all of these bits of context are relevant to the thing that you remember. Uh, and if you actually think about how we remember things, we don't think about it in terms of, you know, a pure semantic graph. We think about, you know, what did we talk about yesterday was when we were having breakfast, things like that. So I think in general, having more context uh, and more chronolo chronology of, of our ideas and notes might be interesting. And so there's sort of four big ideas to incremental note-taking. The first uh, is that captured ideas are better than missed ideas. Uh, it seems like a really simple idea of like the, the biggest determinant of the usefulness of a note-taking tool is just how much you capture. Um, but not all tools kind of, not all tools measure up by this standard. Uh, to capture a lot of ideas, the, the even, even sort of lightweight, small, you know, idle thoughts, tools have to be fast, they have to be lightweight so that you can open it up and write something down or, or jot something down and put it away. Tools that are kind of slow to load or slow to respond are not as good for this. Uh, it has to be always available, offline compatible and things like that. The second principle is that uh, it's a little more controversial. It's that adding notes, adding two notes or adding more notes is better than updating old ideas because updating is kind of a destructive, uh, destructive action. If you think about, uh, for example, like let's say you have a note about a person and as your you know, perception of them changes over time, one way to keep notes about them is to sort of erase and update and keep that note about that person constantly updated. Uh, and that's good. And it's kind of like evergreen and you have only the most recent information there, but maybe it doesn't teach you, you know, the history of your relationship with them or how your thinking evolved with them, which could be important information. Um, and I think this kind of append only, or at least append first approach of when you learn something new, you just write something new that supersedes perhaps other old knowledge, but doesn't replace it. I think might be an interesting approach. The third principle is that ideas you can't recall are worse than useless. Uh, it means that, that effective recall is sort of central to a good note-taking system because there's input and there has to be good output, right? Or at least like good retrieval of information. And there's a few different ways that recall can happen. Uh, the most obvious one is search. You put in a few constraints, full text search or sort of faceted search to try to figure out, pull out kind of the notes or information that you want. Uh, you can also sort of recall by following connections. These are like backlinks and references, right? So like you're looking at a person and you can recall sort of conversations that you had with them, companies that they work at and things like that. And then um, contextual reminders. So like maybe uh, this is sort of, I think, more common in like everyday people usage of like, oh, I want to remember this when the next time I go to Walmart or the next time I talk to Jess, I'll like have a set up a contextual reminder. Uh, in general, I think recall... Uh, you know, if capture is important for input, then recall is, is sort of the, the metric for output. And then lastly, uh, time is essential to how we remember. Time has to be a first class concept, a first class citizen in our note taking systems. Um, it means that like, for example, you can't have an evergreen note system that's just like exists outside of time where it's just like a graph of like an abstract graph of knowledge because the way we recall things is 
by using sort of time as landmarks. Like what, what did I do last week? What did I do when I talked to that person last time? You know, what did I do this morning? What have I learned in the last week, in the last month, in the last quarter? And uh, that's not a coincidence. Like time is like the the milestones by which our memory works. And I think time uh, being time being a first class citizen, a first class concept, whether that's like scrubbing through a timeline of your notes or looking at edit history, I think is a really effective way to kind of explore our knowledge. Uh, so keeping knowledge in the context of time is important. And I think if you take all those four things together, you get this sort of picture of incremental note taking or incremental note taking tools, or at least approaches that's an append first, uh, that's about building an append first graph of notes that puts uh, the concept of time front and center, sort of a chronology of notes where you can follow both a graph of notes and sort of the provenance of all of your ideas rather than just an abstract garden or graph of, of semantics. And uh, it's also a general approach, right? So you can uh, sort of replicate this in Evernote. You can try to replicate this in Rome. I think it's a little more work because of the way that time is dealt with, but but I think you can replicate it in Rome with daily notes. Uh, you can obviously replicate it in Ideaflow, which is the tool that I'm building, which I won't have time to talk about today, but it's a similar idea, a graph-based note-taking system uh, that's sort of like timeline first rather than graph first. Um, so that's that's incremental note-taking. Um, and, and that's the, the main sort of method that I want to talk about. The next thing I want to talk about uh, which is pretty separate, but just happened to be in the same presentation, is the tool. And um, this tool is something I've been working on for the last two, three weeks. It's called Monocle. Monocle is a personal, universal personal search engine for sort of everything in my life. And so uh, this is, it's open source on GitHub. It's written in Inc, which is a programming language that I wrote uh, for no particular reason other than like, I like writing programming languages. But uh, Monocle is universal personal search engine. It indexes my journals, my blogs, uh, basically all of my public writing, my tweets, bookmarks from my pocket archive, notes, contacts, and a bunch of other stuff. And it basically lets me search in real time through that entire archive. So it, it's, it's a kind of a true extended memory. If I ever wrote something down anywhere, uh, the, the goal of Monocle is to like make it searchable and recallable very, very quickly. Um, and now is the demo. And this is the, the time when I, when I checked to see that the demo built perfectly. And it did. So let me stop sharing. And share a different screen. All right, so this is Monocle. This is a build of Monocle that has all of my private documents kind of censored out because I don't want to accidentally leak stuff. Uh, but for example, if I search for tools for thought, um, that's a little slow because I'm also streaming. Um, but uh, you, can, you can see there's 337 results. Uh, from my sort of 19,000 documents that talk about tools for thought or tools or something like that. So these are blogs that I wrote. Uh, this is like uh, uh, a blog by my friend Evan about um, kind of tools for, for thought from a perspective of like emotional intelligence. This is about incremental note-taking. In fact, you can also search for incremental note-taking uh, and get a bunch of results that are about incremental things, perhaps not note-taking. You can search for side project ideas. Um, you can search for New York, which is the place that I live and find sort of things about this is Pogram's idea article about the, about cities and, and how they make you feel. So that's the basic idea. And the, the basic idea is pretty simple. It's like index all of your things and then you can, you can search over them. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the things that I prioritize in building it, uh, the, the first thing that I prioritize in building it is just speed. Not only from the speed, the perspective of like, uh, like loading speed or anything like that, but just like, like one of the things that, seems minor, but I, I paid a lot of attention to is that um, you, it, the search happens in real time as you type the query. So uh, uh, Dormant Find is a place that I, I worked at. And as you as you type in the phrase, you sort of see the results come and come and go. And I think that real time kind of nature of feedback actually sort of changes how you use a tool. So instead of sending a query and, and getting it back, you're able to kind of explore in real time as you type in searches. Um, Mustang or maybe like like team. Uh, and, and I think it changes kind of how you use the tool. So it's fast, uh, it loads all the index and I can, I can talk about um, kind of how it works later, but uh, it basically takes all the documents, indexes it all, uh, wraps it up into a little uh, JSON index and then, um, and then it lets you search over them. And all the, all the search happens in the browser. Uh, so that's, that's a general tool. Um, uh, you can search for like Jess and here's a couple things. You're like some, some quotes that I have from him in my notes some uh, blogs that I wrote that reference this stuff. Uh, so it's kind of fun. And it's sometimes it's just fun to type in stuff that you think might be interesting uh, or might have uh, sort of pull up interesting things. Like I searched for 
uh, regular expressions the other day. And it's just like all the things that I know about regular expressions, which is mostly stuff from my pocket archive. Um, but that's a general tool. Um, and recently I did something really interesting with this, which is that I made this my default search engine <laughs> in my Chrome. And so it means that if you, if you type in uh, tools for thought, um, it doesn't search Google for tools for thought, it searches Monocle. Uh, so this is now my production deployment. So it might have some, some weird stuff, but this is, this is searching my 20, 23,000 document archive for tools for thought. Um, and this is all the things that I know about tools for thought. And the way that I think about it is searching Google is sort of like about discovery. Like you're trying to find new information. And so you're sort of looking towards the future, like searching your own future about whatever you're searching for. Whereas this is all my past. It's like things that I wrote about, things that I read. So I'm like searching my past. So by default, I went from my default search being like trying to discover something to my default search being like trying to recall something. And, and the effect that's had on my workflow so far is that uh, because my muscle memory is still developing, a lot of times I went and want to search Google, I actually accidentally searched my own monocle. And the, the end result is that a lot of times I end up finding sort of missed connections. Like yesterday I was looking up this thing called a trigram index, which is a kind of, kind of a full text search index. And I was trying to Google it because it was an idea that I never heard of before or so I thought. And so I was like trying to find new information about it. But it turns out actually, actually I bookmarked, I read and bookmarked a, a blog post about trigram indexes from, um, from Russ Cox, who used to be an engineer at Google and wrote about this, the search problem. And uh, I, it just didn't register in my head because the first time I had read it, it I probably didn't get it. And so now that I, I have this extra context about what trigram indexes are, and now I read this blog post, uh, it sort of made that missed connection, right? I can, I can look at the old thing and learn a little more about what I learned back then. I can understand a little more about trigram indexes. And so I think it's, it's just been an overall really interesting experience. And the last kind of cool aha moment that I want to talk about is, um, is uh, this thing. So here's a, a, one of my favorite blog posts from Craig Maud about fast software, the performance and software. And uh, let's say I'm reading this. I'm like, oh, this person's talking about this tool called NVAlt. And I don't know what NVAlt is. Well, I can right click and I can search monocle for NVAlt. This is so cool. And now, and now I, I'm effectively turning this entire document into sort of like a pseudo backlinked document, right? Like I can right click on anything and like, they'll just like search all of my artificial memory for this thing. And I can, obviously the article comes up, but also envy the tool, my notes on that tool, my Dioflow, uh, uh, sort of Connor's thoughts on Rome research and how it mentions envy and rotational velocity, which is a tool that's related. And so I think that experience is just sort of like, whoa, like there's a lot of doors that I could open. If I could sort of auto generate and pick out these words and backlink them, like that would be real cool. So there's, there's a lot of directions that it could go. Um, I also want to work in performance a little bit because it, it's a little laggy right now, but um, that's the, that's kind of the search engine. And I think that's, uh, it's, it's got a lot of people excited, got me excited about like search as a general approach to building really interesting tools for thought. So that's Monocle. Um, I don't think I have time to talk about how it works, but this is the general architecture. If you go to the GitHub page, which I'll link later, you can talk about it. Basically we have a bunch of um, data sources. They go into a tokenizer that, that uh, generates, breaks this down into individual words. We index them based on how many times the words appear in each document. And then we have this sort of like search pipeline where we, you try to find all the matching documents and try to rank them in, in sort of a pretty standard order um, and return the results. It's just like geeking out nerdy stuff. Um, there's a little bit of interesting prior art that I'll sort of zip through because we're closing it on time. But uh, these are projects that I, I think are sort of in similar vein and pretty interesting. There's obviously the classic MX from Vinuva Bush about uh, this machine that like, you probably all know what it is, a machine that sort of archives all the things that you've seen and, and read and are interesting, connects them and you can, you can query through it, which I think, I think Monocle is sort of approaching or at least in, in the silhouette of. Um, two other projects that I found interesting from a Hacker News thread that, that was up a couple of days ago was one is called APSC, a personal search engine, which has, it takes this really creative approach of it just snapshots your desktop screen every, every uh, once in a while. And then uh, OCR is everything. So it remembers exactly and, ever, and exactly and only what you've seen on your computer. Um, and you can search through it and, and sort of literally sort of time travel back to when you first saw it, which I think is super, super interesting. Um, and then there's a project called Dogsheep, which is a collection of sort of tools that let you pull in external data sources into a SQLite database and then perform searches on that SQLite database, um, which I think is also really cool. And so there, there are two sort of major takeaways that I had from building Monocle and continuing to build Monocle and experiment with it um, that I wanted to leave you with. The first one is that, that 
we we're trying to build tools for thought, but really thought is all around us. It's not just in these apps that we're building, siloed in these apps that we're building. Like even if you're like a Power Room user, you are sending messages to people, you have email, you have things that you're reading. Like there, there exists information that you probably want to catalog and search through and remember outside of these like isolated tools. And I think if you want to build sort of the, like I, I think as a prediction, like future tools for thought will let you integrate with all of these data sources, not by just pulling the, all of them into a single tool, but by letting, letting tools sort of navigate this, this more expansive universe of knowledge. Um, and that's, that's, I think, sort of in the spirit of what, what the search engine does. And then um, secondly, and lastly, I think we should think about building sort of a universe of tools that work together to create and, and make possible new workflows rather than sort of these silos that you have to operate within. Like workflows should not be based, not be like product-based or product-focused, but be problem-focused. Like the problem shouldn't, the, the workflow shouldn't be like, oh, I need to find a person, I should go to this app. Uh, where it has all the information. You should be like, I need to find my information about this person. I'm just going to search. Like that's the problem. And then there should be a tools that let you let you perform that search across, you know, whatever sort of knowledge domain you have. And so I think that's the the other other big takeaway. And I'd invite you all to um, try to think about tool building more in this way. And so we've arrived at the end of our journey. Uh, we have some tools. We're still trying to figure it out. Uh, but I think we these are sort of interesting ideas as we try to navigate the sea of information. Um, about how to how to build tools and perhaps uh, build better methodologies and how to organize your information. So, thanks. Thanks, Linus. That was awesome. Um, yeah, I especially loved like that final takeaway point of like we need we really need a universe of tools that work together. Um, so yeah, everybody give Linus a hand, jazz hands, and or claps in in uh, in uh, Zoom. Yeah, so I'd like to open the floor at this time to questions for Linus about monocle or incremental note taking or uh, anything really. So. so, Linus, you showed the input modules that you're indexing. Um, yeah. Were those in specific formats, or can you kind of take in any text? That... Yeah, that's a good question. So, the right now the search engine is very text focused. Um, there are other prior art that tries to do really smart things with images um, that I've seen that are actually really, really impressive. There's one that I saw um, uh, that was like, th there's a YouTube talk uh, that you can probably search for if you type in like Memex Ruby. Um, that's like a, a Memex built on Ruby and they do OCR text. So like if you take a screenshot of a slide at like a conference, you can like search for it, which is really impressive. Um, but my ingest is like, uh, basically every document needs a title, um, uh, some content, uh, in addition to the title, uh, a URL that you can link out to. And that's about it. So anything you can like boil down in that form, at least in my system, uh, you can put into the search index. Um, so like tweets, for example, they don't really have a title. So the title is just a whole whole tweet. Um, and then it had like links out to the tweet. But that's a general form. It's like very open, but there is a standard like JSON format that it ingests. And then it like the, the same like index and code just turns through data in that format. And so that, um... Yeah, so do you just publish, when you're indexing, do you publish locally all of your notes or are your notes actually public? Ah, or like how, how would you do like a, a private indexing of your? Yeah, so huh, this is where it gets to like the more convoluted parts of my system. So I actually have, I have a lot of my personal infrastructure built out. And one of the interesting things is I have like a shared storage layer, which is basically like a worse Dropbox. <laughs> Um, and so I have the storage layer, which is like a giant synced directory on my desktop and all of my other apps, like my personal notes apps and things like that, all just persist data onto this like giant synced folder. And then what the search engine does is it like, um, knows where all of my notes files are, uh, in that giant synced folder. And so it goes and just fetches those notes and indexes it, um, for other external sources like Twitter or pocket, it requires a little bit more manual sort of data export at the moment. Um, I don't have a huge desire to make it automatic, although there's other projects that try to make it a little more automatic using the APIs. Uh, the nice thing about a manual export is like typically it's faster because you just get a data dump instead of like having to page through like thousands of pages of API requests. Um, and so that's the way that it works for now. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Yeah. The uh, Promnesia project that uh, Kali Koss pr presented you know, has a ton of different interfaces and his whole approach is to read in APIs and dump them. And then his approach is like, it's it's very much for his use cases. You run a little Python server uh, and it connects to a browser extension. Right. So you can choose whether stuff is public or private. 
Um, I think this ends up being really interesting about, um, you know, essentially, are we too early to have common formats? What does it mean to share indexes? Um, and even things like choice of programming language. <laughs> right, for sure. Uh, uh, definitely a part of the monocle was like, the reason I initially built it was like, I wanted to learn how like full text search worked. So I, I built a full text search system, which is why it uses a custom one and not like Alexa search like a normal person, um, same, same person would. But I built in its full text search system and then I was like, what can I build with this? And I was like, why not just like index all of my notes uh, and sort of like balloon from there. I have a quick Matt, question. Whoop, whoop. I think Sorry. Raphael. Yeah, uh, great demo. Uh, I love to see the um, uh, using Monaco instead of using Google to find uh, your things. And that brought up a question regarding um, quantity versus curation. So mm -hmm. for example, um, if you go to archive.org, they archive pretty much everything. Uh, they don't pick and choose. Uh, and I got a little bit of that feeling with Monaco, uh, especially since you have more than 20,000 documents. Yeah. Uh, I, felt, I felt a need of more um, gathering to find later instead of pick and choosing. Because um, I think whenever there's curation, there's also destruction, uh, like there is when you change instead of add. So I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, regarding quantity versus curation. What's yeah. the balance? Yeah, that's a great question. So the short answer is there is a balance to be struck and it's the reason why I index my pocket archive instead of my entire browsing history, which is something I've thought about. Um, I think, so this is something I thought about in the abstract. I think in practical usage so far, it's actually been pretty high signal. Uh, there are 23,000 dots on me and actually, actually the, the secret is that that's the like, like number that I flash on the GitHub page, but in reality, 16,000 of them are my tweets. Um, so there's really like, like 7,000 actually semantically important documents. Um, cause a lot of my tweets are like RT heart emoji and then like a link to another tweet. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, so in my case, curation hasn't, or the quantity hasn't really been a problem, um, so far, just practically speaking, like the ranking, uh, the TFIDF ranking function seems to bring up the most relevant results to the top pretty reliably. Um, which means like, even if there are weird faulty matches, um, they, they sink to the bottom of the list. So I don't see them as much. Um, I think in the general case, um, it, it would be a little more of a problem, especially as you index more and more information. But I think um, ranking still, I think is going to be like the key component there. Like, like uh, I think the, the right answer in my opinion is probably just like indexing more information and then be smarter about how you rank things. Maybe not just by like the context of the, the text, but like other signals, like how often you reference it from your other notes and things like that. Like I think there's a lot of creative things you can do with ranking mm -hmm. uh, rather than mm -hmm. like, like the thing that I, and tend to not like about curation is Linus yeah. to, to your point about time being a first class citizen recency as well of right. like how recent is this yeah so yeah i think ranking is right it gets a lot more interesting about like sort of curating it's just sort of effectively like curating after the fact right rather than like in the moment which i think preserves a lot more information yeah i, I think it's interesting because you mentioned linus that you know new tools all, uh, make possible new workflows and if you think that like we're constantly as human beings flitting between a couple of different modes of thinking, one of which is ingestion, right? We're out there reading things and we're just bringing in new ideas. And uh, so if we kind of thought of this as like we're ingesting new ideas, although a lot of them are like you said, processed because you, you've written about them. But then there's this other part which we could call curation, we could call it uh, structure building or something where basically we're trying to figure out like, okay, this new idea, where does this fit into all of the other ideas that I have? Um, and it might be interesting to think of these as, you know, different parts of the workflow where, you know, I'm in ingestion mode right now and I'm in, you know, structure building mode right now. I'm in communication mode right now or, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's a, yeah, there's like also other really interesting implicit signals. Like one that I've thought about is like, if you index your, decide to index your entire browser history, like time spent on page is probably an interesting and like ranking signal, um, mm -hmm. towards the point of creating them as different workflows. Um, I think that's a very clean way to think about it. Um, I think it's interesting when like, like ingest and search become sort of a part of a single workflow, like, like when you're reading an article, but if you can like, one of the things I've thought about is just using basic sort of, um, uh, uh, what is it like, 
word vectors to, as, as I'm reading like an article in the browser, try to find similar articles on similar topics from my like data archive and like surface it. So then it's like search is happening while ingest is also happening. Uh, so again, like a lot of really interesting opportunities once you like have this data archive and you can like perform various kinds of searches over them. Mm -hmm. Jerry. Yeah. Jerry, yeah. Just a quick, oh, hi, Lynn, it's very nice. Uh, just a quick question. You said something which I may have misheard that uh, highlight first rather than graph first. Whatever, whatever you want to say there, could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So timeline first with the graph first. I think. I don't know. It's 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 not something that I'm a hundred percent dead set on. But I think it's something that, just as playing devil's advocate, as I think an interesting idea to think about is like, uh, the way that like I think humans conceptualize memory and how to remember things is not generally by traversing a mental graph of things. It's by like, you know, remembering using context to hop between different places in your memory. Like when I think about how I'm going to remember this later today, it's probably not going to be like by the topics that we talked about necessarily, but but more concretely like by oh like this event happened this morning, um, and obviously there's some mix, which is why it's a timeline first and not like only timeline. But I think um, practically speaking, like there are reasons why people keep like logs and journals. Um, it's because like it's organized by time, which I think is a perhaps some just maybe just like a lower cognitive load way to organize things. Um, maybe actually more useful. Uh, I think ideally it's a, it's a mix of those two, but I think as, as someone who's working on, like my perspective is idea flow, one of our focuses is just like taking a lot of the good ideas of Rome and these graph based noting tools and trying to make it a lot more accessible to the average person. And the average person, I think generally, like the average person who's like using Apple notes generally has an easier time conceptualizing timelines of notes rather than a pure graph. Um, so I think from, from that perspective, at least from making it more accessible and understandable, a timeline first view is worth exploring. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah. Oh, time for one more question, John. I saw you had your hand up. You want to ask? Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, fantastic work. Big fan of the the stuff that that, that you've done here, um, Linus. So the the question really is is um, you've been talking a lot about workflows and tools and things like that, and I was wondering if you thought more because this is very much like the Unix philosophy for. Um, you know, building things that can compose together in interesting ways. Or we talked a little bit earlier about ingestion and then now there's like the search component, which is another tool, right? Um, right. You know, in this is kind of like the grep for, you know, you know, some cat things that, that you've done in the beginning. And right. have you thought more about this? Like, like, I'm curious about what your ingestion, like I see that you index um, on pocket, but you, but there's also the dub 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 thing, which I'm not sure what that was. Oh, that's um, just the blog. That's my blog, right? Oh, that's your blog. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Um, so, so kind of your, your indexing your outputs and then things you've captured explicitly inside a pocket, what other things have you thought about here? And then what can we do to try and build a mechanism where we can kind of build these kind of composable tools? Cause I think the really interesting thing is to do these things in the cloud, right. As opposed to necessarily even in a private thing, right. Cause right. when you built your storage thing, you've kind of got that thing as well in there. So anyways, super interested in what your general thoughts are here. Sorry for the abstract question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so on the Unix philosophy thing, I think that that's actually uh, really, I, I love that you brought it up because I'm a big, a big Unix philosophy fan. And the, the high level way that I think about a lot of my projects is like, I think like when you're building a, like a venture backed company on top of one of these tools, to like build a search engine and you're like, you know, how can we grow our user base? I can like expand our market and you sort of inevitably balloon your product into like, like including like a note taking app or like search engine happens to like include a social media component inside or something like, or like an email app, like every, like the, the principle, classic principle of like every, you know, sophisticated app evolves to like include an email, email, um, email app inside. So I think, but when you're building a personal app, I think the constraint that I've been able to exercise both because it's out of principle and because like I don't have time to <laughs> balloon all of these apps out of proportion is like I can build a search engine that is literally just about search, like literally just prep. And then like I can build a separate small thing that is just about ingestion. Um, so I don't I don't know. I think I think trying to build bigger um, whether businesses or other kinds of tools on top of uh, this like kind of Unix -y principles will require some constraint or some restraint or some discipline to like sticking to um, like that single purpose and just general philosophy of like, if you want to do something different, you should build a different tool that integrates rather than like polluting this particular tool. Um, so those are my thoughts on the Unix philosophy. I think um, I, I'm also kind of a Unix traditionalist in that like, I really like plain text as the universal format. 
And so all my notes are like in plain text markdown and then all my tools in just plain text markdown. Um, that obviously I think is maybe not obvious, but I think, I think that's kind of not as feasible for like commercial tools where like, for example, I work on a note taking tool and like our internal format is like a proprietary like JSON format that includes sort of very certain kinds of annotations you can put on the document and like that nobody else can understand it. So I have to like have a just transformation algorithm that, that takes that and turns it into plain text in my ingestion queue. Um, and so I think commercially, that's a, it's, it's a good question asked to like, how can we, you know, create these kind of good interfaces right now? I think the, that this is not a great answer right now. I think the best shot is like all of these tools at least have good export because of GDPR, like pocket is decent export, even, um, Twitter, like gave me like a one gigabyte file out of which like a few megabytes was like my tweets. And I, I took those tweets, which was in a JSON format and then like put it into my database. Um, so maybe we can like build a layer on top of that that tries to get everything to speak a somewhat unified um, kind of way of talking about these documents. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think, I think it's a hard problem. I don't think there's a good answer. Super, thank you. Uh, like, yep. Thanks, John. Thanks, Linus. Uh, we're going to let Kevin have a second here um, to talk about what he's working on. Uh, so Kevin is a software engineer. He's been working on a product called Dendron, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, Dendron is a super fast note-taking note tool that works currently inside VS Code. Um, so Kevin works in public as well. So you can see some of his like personal notes on his site that are published via Dendron as well. So using his own tools to publish his stuff in a very uh, Linus fashion. Um, Dinjon already has a really active community of users and has been downloaded tens of thousands of times. Um, so it's cool to see how quickly that has grown. But today, uh, Kevin's going to be talking about um, a, a Dinjon initiative called SeedBank, which is really interesting relative to interop, interchange. How do we actually take things beyond our personal knowledge graphs and share them with others? So excited to uh, see what you have to, to talk about today, Kevin. Cool. Uh, thank you, Jess, for the introduction. and. Awesome talk, Linus. Thanks for that. Um, it's funny you mentioned plain text uh, and Unix. So I'm a big fan of both. And I also happen to be the founder now of a YC and venture backed business. And we're building a plain text uh, based tool of thought. So let's see how far we can get. Um, great. So welcome, everyone. Today, my talk is going to be about the Dungeon Seed Bank. And essentially, this is an initiative we're currently about halfway through to getting to your beta of building a general registry or a public registry for general knowledge. Um, the way this talk is going to be structured, um, I'll go over a little background about Dendron and myself, talk a little bit about Dendron just to set up the context for the C-Bank, talk about the C-Bank, and then we'll have the 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So first, a little about me. So I'm a software engineer. Uh, most of the relevant points are in the slide. Highlights are, I worked at AWS as a backend engineer for five plus years, and then I quit to work on a local note-taking tool. Um, and I've been working on Dungeon full-time since uh, 2020. And then at the end of the year, we ended up going to YC. Um, okay, so in terms of Dungeon, this is a two-liner. Um, we, so there's lots of note-taking tools and they all have various focuses. What Dungeon focuses on is structure. So we're a hierarchy first uh, knowledge base. And we're also, because we work inside VS Code and IDE, currently our target audience is also more developers and people who are technical. The way that you can think of Dendron is we're more Excel, less Google. So uh, our approach is not that we're indexing all your notes and then searching, helping you search through it. We do that as well. But it's more that we help you enforce a consistent structure for all your notes so that you can build your personal index so that it's quick to look stuff up um, and change the structure of your notes as you're thinking about it evolves. Um, and just to go over a little basics for a dungeon. So we're uh, plain text based. And then the way you navigate is using something we call lookup, and we also have backlinks. Um, and we, and the core idea with Dendron is that your notes can be organized in these hierarchies, and you can document and change these hierarchies using schemas. Um, so a quick showcase of what that looks like. So this is VS Code, and this is a typical Dendron workspace. 
Uh, it's Markdown. We have a preview on the side, and then we have some Flint matter on the top that stores uh, metadata. You can also add your own information. Um, the way that you look for anything is using command L. And so, for example, if you wanted to look up something on Python, here's Python. And then you can also see all the nodes that it's linked in using uh, the backlinks. So we also have, you know, essentially this graph-based view. Um, in addition to looking stuff up via the hierarchy. Um, now, the next thing that's uh, relevant is for Dendron, what we try to focus on is structure. So this idea that actually, like when you think about hierarchies, traditionally you think about file hierarchies and folders and a mess and how like it all just evolves. And so what we focus on is this idea of like these lightweight hierarchies that you can define and change. Um, and so what this kind of looks like, so here I like, this is for example, a hierarchy of, I have of the Python programming language. The way that um, hierarchies are defined in Dungeon is via this YAML. Um, YAML is not the most straightforward to showcase. So we also have a visual, but essentially this is kind of like the visualization of my programming language hierarchy. And what it's saying is, hey, every language has data structures that I care about. There are certain topics in every language um, that I care about, but all languages essentially have this similar shape. Um, and the reason why this is uh, interesting or useful is, so this is a local graph. We can switch to the journal graph. Um, right now, for example, I'm in Python. And as somebody that programs in multiple languages, something I often look up is like, what is true and false in these different languages? Um, let's put this down on the bottom. And so right now I'm in Python, but then if I switch to Ruby, uh, because all my programming notes have the same structure, I can, uh, I just need to switch the beginning part of this query and then I'm in Ruby. Um, and the idea here is that it doesn't matter how many different languages I'm tracking or what I'm thinking about. Um, at the end of the day, what I'm keeping in my head is my index of that programming language hierarchy. And so I'm collapsing the space of all programming languages into like one abstract model of what I think a programming language is. And um, this way, um, it's quick for me to uh, essentially add more languages and keep track of it all in a way where I don't have to rely on search to find what I need. Okay, and then the last part to just for a setup for seeds, um, I think before we talked about like this idea of how do you manage public and private notes and whatnot, um, the way that Dendron does this is we partition your notes into what we call vaults. So each vault you can think of as a folder and that's backed by Git. And so some use cases for this is you wanna split up your work and personal docs. This is something that's quite common for users is they have their you know, work notes locally on their work machine, but then their personal notes on Dropbox. And then they use Sendrin to have like a unified interface over that all. Um, or the thing that I use it for is I have a public part of my workspace and a private part of my workspace. And then the public part I publish on GitHub and the private part I don't. Okay. So now all that has been kind of background to talk more about the C bank, which is currently the main focus uh, at Dendron is building this out and pushing it out. Okay, and so if you are uh, from a programming background, um, it's very similar to NPM. And if you're not familiar with it, NPM is this package registry for Node.js or JavaScript, where if you need anything, like I mean any sort of module, something as complicated as you know uh, running distributed tasks to something as banal as left padding your string, you can find it on NPM. It has anything that you're looking for. And that's, well, NPM is a package registry. And basically, all major programming languages have package registries. And the reason they do it is because of this, like, because code is modular. You can reuse it. You can compose it. There's all these nice benefits of code where you can build it on top of each other. And you get that because um, the structure 
because code has those properties and you have a registry that makes it easy to publish, discover, and collaborate on this. And so Dendron, right, we're trying to provide both pieces of the puzzle. So the features that I just talked about before with the schemas and the hierarchies, that's us trying to essentially give knowledge a general lightweight structure that's not too heavy handed. Like back in the day, you know, we've there's been the semantic web effort, there's been XML, and generally all those approaches have failed because it's really um, it's really hard to specify a format that will work for everything. And so our approach is actually just make it as light as possible in terms of structure. We're like the JSON to XML. The only structure right now that we kind of help you maintain is the structure of your hierarchy. But, and then the nodes are still relatively freeform. But um, we think that like doing this lightweight approach is a better place to start up, off from than from the heavy handed that spec out everything before it's actually like in the wild. Okay, so the goal with the seed registry and also Dendron more in general is making knowledge more like code because code is something um, I think Linus was talking about in the beginning have like, we have too much information and it's hard to navigate it. It's like you're lost at sea. Well, um, if you think, if you squint a little bit, code is kind of like that. Code is just information. And even if you look at the, and if you look at the biggest like software projects like Linux um, and the Android operating system, it's huge that like people are still able to talk about it like sanely, divide it into different components, refactor it. And that's because code has some structure um, and it makes it possible for humans to scale and work with it. And so uh, the idea here is to transfer a lot of the learnings we've done from working with code, which is semi-structured information and trying to apply that to general knowledge. Okay, um, so touching upon some of the points I mentioned before, what makes code work at scale for humans is that you can compose it so you can embed one piece of code into another project. It's modular, you can split up a big code pieces into little pieces and we use each piece as needed and then reusability. Um, and then the idea of like why you want to do this, um, we have so much information out there, like nothing comes from a vacuum. Everything we build upon really is building upon something else that already exists. So the idea is like, this will make it easier to do that. A lot of uh, interesting discoveries and interesting uh, thoughts are made at the boundaries between different things. So, you know, can we remix existing knowledge to do new things? Um, and also this idea of like knowledge is always changing. And so, you know, to keep up to date, to stay in pace, we need a way of always keep getting the latest version. Um, this goes into a little bit of the details of like how the seed bank works. So um, every knowledge module, we're calling it a seed. And so right now you can use the CLI. So tension seed add, and then you give the ID of the seed that you want to add. If you want, if you're familiar with NPM, we basically copied the NPM API and just uh, put it into the Dungeon CLI. So you can add a seed with the seed add command. Um, you can create a seed using the seed init command. So this takes your current module and makes it into a seed. Um, and this is the part we're working on is being able to publish a seed. Right now you can do that, but it's submitting a pull request to us on uh, GitHub because right now the seed registry is our hard-coded JSON file that gets shipped to everyone. Um, and so a little bit of how that would look like is so right now this is this a sample workspace that i have um we haven't integrated this into the plugin yet so you would run this on the cli so dungeon seed add um because i happen to know the id of the seed i wanted to add i'm just going to do that um and tldr so what tldr is and right now this requires a manual reload but TLDR is this project that has common um, shortcuts, or it gives you the lowdown of like every single CLI tool that you can think of. Um, we So this is another thing, but Dendron essentially what it does, one of four capabilities is we let you ingest existing markdown documents and then uh, import them into Dendron. And then if you want to, you can also publish it, kind of like what this looks like. And so when you publish a seed, um, you get two things. One is you get a public web portal of uh, the particular uh, notes that you have. 
but then also you have it inside of your local workspace. So if you look over here, so this was, you know, the programming notes that I was showing you initially, and this is the TLDR notes, which uh, I just imported. And so uh, now, for example, if I wanted to look up something on Netstat, um, here is some notes about Netstat. Um, and this is a couple of different things. It's like one is now, depending on different projects, maybe if you're working on a networking task versus working on like a design task, um, you can you know, create knowledge uh, workspaces with the specific dependencies that you need. So, and this is actually what we do inside at Dungeon ourselves. We use one big Dungeon workspace to manage everyone's tasks and developers will get one set of vaults and designers uh, get another set. I say that we don't have designers. And so you can also tell that from our interface, but when we do get designers, they will get a different set of vaults. Um, so that's one thing is you can kind of petition your knowledge base along these different lines. But then the other thing is, um, so I mentioned how Dungeon has like, Markdown. Uh, we actually do a super set of Markdown. So, for example, uh, we provide additional features, like we call them uh, references. And so, references is embedding a note into a different note. And so, you can imagine that you know, if you were, let's say, that I am writing a runbook for this new static server that I have. So, like, how to, you know, debug uh, server issues, and we're running on Python. So I have, for example, a Python like uh, cookbook on here's how you start an HTTP server in Python. Um, instead of you know rewriting that or copying that, I can kind of reuse that inside this uh, note. And let's just if I highlight this, I can make this into a new note. I'm just going to call it playbook for now. And so if we take a look now at the playbook, this is kind of like the analogy to think of is like importing a module from code. I'm kind of importing these little snippets from these various documents to make a new document. And then I can add some additional instructions along the way, like, oh, like uh, this and sign TCP, use the TCP flag. Um, and this is a quick way to essentially remix existing information and put them together into like a new document, which I can now publish. Um, Oh, and one thing that's not necessarily anything to do with seeds, but I think people are usually really excited about is once you publish something as a seed, because uh, it's also a public facing site, uh, we have a way of generating a link to it so that it's very easy to uh, share that with others. Um, one of the principles for Dendron is this idea that like anything in your workspace, anything in your knowledge base, you should be able to you know, look it up in a few keystrokes and then also share it with others. So it's just like instant being able to find and share like all the things that you're currently thinking about. Okay, um, let's see, back to this. Um, and so some of the reasons why this is compelling is you know you never have to start from a blank page. Like the idea is that you can, there is knowledge out there. There is something out there that has something to do with what you're using on. It's all a matter about finding it and putting it into what you're using. Um, sharing what you know, like we see this a lot in uh, code where like GitHub has exploded the popularity of open source and everybody's publishing modules and uh, projects and things that they're working on. But it's not kind of the same with like, research, like projects, like if you're studying about something, like for example, right now, for me, I am doing continuous glucose monitoring. And it's a fascinating topic, just because it's, um, the reason I started to do it is because like, I would get tired in the afternoon. And I'm trying to like figure out like, you know, is this caused by a blood sugar spike. And so, um, because it's relatively easy just to like, uh, publish this using my plain text and then pushing it uh, out. Like I have, like, it makes it a lot easier to do, well, for example, incremental writing. So I hear I have like some snippets from my daily journals that are public. So this is tracking like my glucose over time. But then I also have like a longer section on glucose where I'm like, I'm researching concepts. And it's kind of like interweaving like the daily timeline of like, here's what I'm learning every day. If you like the more ter permanent landmarks of like, here are the things that I am actually 
like I want to like build up something more concrete than just like a daily note. Um, but the idea is like with the seed bank, it's it'll be much easier for people to share this information. And this idea is like if we can promote the same sort of like outreach and collab that you kind of see on GitHub with code. Um, right now, the back end for all of this is plain text and Git. And so this idea is that it's also will be easy relatively for anyone else to contribute. So for example, if I end up publishing, you know, this glucose module as its own seed, um, ideally, like other people doing glucose monitoring would do the same thing or like contribute to this and we'll build out like a really cool um, reference guide to all things glucose monitoring. Um, and yeah, and so the goal here is building an open knowledge registry of everything you can think of, ignore the typo. Okay, and so in closing, one of the uh, driving principles behind Dendron um, and kind of why I went into it is this quote by Van Bush. He was an early uh, player in the space of information science. Um, and it's on the page, but the justice, like back in 94, there was too much information and we don't have the proper tools to properly deal with them. And so creating these tools should be our first objective. And so kind of what Dendron is trying to do is make it possible for us to build upon everything that has come before and everything that is currently coming. Okay, uh, that is it. So now I will open the floor to questions. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for the talk. All right, and at this point, anybody can unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'll call on you using this, the Zoom interface. But Gary, you got something? Yep, I think you're on mute. Yeah, you're okay, muted, okay, 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 I have yeah. done. Uh, I really love it because when you say, well, make knowledge more like code, I want to make code more like knowledge. That's one. I start from a blank page because I want to articulate my learning, okay? And so I'm not, it's like, we need both, okay? But I just yep. love that, that from the same spectrum, you, you at that end, which is, it's a, you are on, 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 on firm ground. And it is indeed the case that, uh, that while programmers had always known the importance of versions and knowledge and, and refactoring and everything, and they had the kind of database that knowledge really needs, and we didn't have that for general knowledge. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that's really interesting. And there's a new word that I picked up yesterday, which is simathesi. So it's basically simathesi, which is learning together. And yeah. that, I, will, I will share a link to that amazing post because basically she is looking at exactly the idea that all coding is a kind of not just code, code is the last thing. It's a really complex knowledge management, intent and, and, and customers, everything. So in fact, the, in the old days, and I've finished now, Maven was supposed to be that, that project comprehension tool. So if you make your project comprehension tool clever enough, it's basically identical to a, a really good knowledge management tool. But uh, I really like what you do. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And I would agree with those points. Eric, did you have something? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> this is a topic I've talked to you about before, Jess. That, uh, so Jess and I were in graduate school together. And if anyone has had the misfortune to go to graduate school, um, basically when you're, when you're trying, or this is at least how it worked, uh, you know, I guess a couple of decades ago when we were in graduate school. But you come up with an idea and then you are, you know, in Linus's uh, situation where you're on that island and you're like, okay, the first thing that they tell you you need to do is figure out what has been done in that area before. And then basically you're just, you're wandering around aimless until you find a paper where somebody has done something like that before. And then you kind of read through it and then you read through the references and then you're like, okay, all right, well, these are some other papers that were written before that one. And it was a tremendous time sink just to try to gather together the, the information of understanding where is the current um, you know, state of the art, where is the current knowledge base in this field. So imagine you wanna learn something more about particle physics and uh, you could find a textbook written in 1983, but that's not gonna give you 
like a, a sense of what the current uh, knowledge base is. Um, so I, I love what you're doing here because that uh, has fit with uh, an idea I've had of just this idea of having a, a Git based uh, approach where you could come into like the particle physics area, right? And there might be uh, a particular element of particle physics where there it, it's unsettled about, you know, what is the cause of some phenomenon, right? And you actually, like you could have branches, right? And so there's the, the branch that this group is working on of, you know, like this is what we think over here and we're building the knowledge up and then this group and, and then, you know, having some way to um, to capture what are the open questions and who is trying to answer this question and what are the open problems that need to be solved in order to, to answer this question is a, um, a fantastic, uh, I, I think it would be a fantastic application of something like this, where in my mind I've struggled is, you know, like, how do we make something that is different than just Googling, right? So like, uh, when do I know I want to go out and I want to download the, the MBM, NPM module, the, the, the dendron seed for uh, particle physics versus when I want to go to Google and type in particle physics? And I don't know, Kevin, have you thought about that at all? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fair question. I think um, usually whenever I talk about like making a tool to help you like find stuff, it's like, oh, like go to Google. Um, and I think the difference there, um, Linus actually touched upon this, is like you go to Google for discovery, for things you might not know about, for things that, you know, you are kind of coping in the dark and Google will give you your first good step. But if you think about also like so much of what we do today is like stuff that we already know. I'll talk about it in programming. Like for programmers, like Google and Stack Overflow are like the top two things that anyone reaches for. The frustrating thing about programming though is like a lot of the things I search for in Stack Overflow are things I've already searched for before. It's just like, it was a month ago, it was some obscure MySQL thing and I had no way of like putting that down in any sort of way that I could find it again later. Plus I could find it in Google in like 30 seconds. So if I can't beat that, then it's not worth the effort. The problem with this approach though is like, you don't learn anything. Like I like never know how to deal with that MySQL issue. I just keep going to Stack Overflow. And so like Dendron, like one, so one way of thinking about Dendron is like the act of having like a lightweight way of putting stuff down and then also like organizing it into hierarchies that make sense to you is also the act of like forming connections. So that now like the first place that you look for, the main difference here is you're searching for something you already know versus something that you wanna discover. And for something that you already know, whenever you search on Google, it's kind of like, you know, before people knew how to read maps, now nobody does and it's all outsourced to Google Maps. And we're kind of doing that with knowledge when we're searching for Google for things we've already encountered. We're not really building upon anything we've known. We're just you know, doing the same thing again and again. And so the nice thing I would say like for the seed bank and dungeon and all this stuff is like, you're using this to strengthen the anchors of like the things that you know, the things that you have mastery over, or at least you're building up a foundation so that, um, you know, you might start off your search on Google and then you might end up at a seed that is part of the seed bank. And then, uh, you know, it might be something that you fork. It might be something that you build upon. But then the more that you invest in that, the more you make that your own versus with Google, like you will never learn to read a map by following Google Maps. And you will never learn to think by just Googling the answer. It's effective, but um, it has limitations. And so the difference here is you are building your own you know, incremental mastery over the over this thing. Um, and then the practical benefit is because you have it available locally and, you know, you can look it up in a few seconds. It's actually faster than like the 30 second, one minute latency that like a Google and Stack Overflow parse will typically give you. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Boris, we could have time for one more question. So. Yeah, um, I'm gonna bring up some hard questions. Um, okay. namespaces, moderation, um, and reputation. Yeah, uh, those are all, uh, issues and it's part of the reason why right now our registry is in static JSON format instead of a publishable endpoint. Um, in terms of namespaces, you kind of saw that when I was doing the seed, the way that we're currently doing this is we're doing like a user slash package namespace. 
Um, I think Go does something similar. So like you as an individual or company, you claim like a username and then everything you publish is under that username. Um, so there's no like global namespace. Everything is uh, under your own domain. Um, and then in terms of, sorry, what, what followed namespaces? Uh, moderation and reputation. Okay. Yeah, uh, moderation and reputation. So moderation wise, um, we're basically, so right now it's everything is moderated. We take a pull request and then uh, we filter to see if things should be included or not. Um, the idea when we publish initially is we're going to do it, it's, it'll be pretty limited, like we'll give some people like publish keys and then just, uh, and then we'll monitor things that come in. But eventually it's kind of like where NPM is today. The idea is we're well, going to have an open registry. We don't really want to be gatekeepers there and then rely on uh, regular moderation, crowdsourced, uh, AI or us manually scanning through things to figure that out. And same with reputation. I think we don't really have like anything beyond, like it's not an area that we've invested much more thought in besides like doing what the state of the art is today and other like-minded efforts like GitHub and NPM. Okay, I guess um, for moderation, um, I would encourage you if you don't already, to write down um, what your principles are. So some keywords to think about misinformation, parody, yes. right, uh, copyright. There's all, there's really, um, I totally get where you're going, where you're in open index and things like that. Um, um, but you are at the end of the day, a centralizing entity. So as a service provider, you could choose to have your own rules on what you publish somewhere, but still make a lot of this stuff available. And of course, if you're using GitHub, then you're in fact inheriting um, their terms of service. So right now, no one in Iran can save seed banks. Um, right, so we are actually, so right now GitHub tends to be the most popular implementation detail that anybody with a remote Git URL can you know, host. So we steer people towards GitHub, but we're not uh, tied towards GitHub. But yeah, but uh, point taken. Well, Kevin, thanks for uh, embarking on this intellectual adventure here where you guys are trying to uh, put out knowledge registries. It's a super ambitious and really valuable thing. So um, definitely rooting for you guys to figure it out. And thanks for the presentation today. Um, yeah, thank you. Sweet. So up next, we have Rafael Nepo. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce your last name, Rafael. I apologize. Um, we've only dialogued via email at this point. Um, but Rafael is a designer, information architect, and creator. He has worked as uh, a lot of different things, a presentation consultant, creative director. He's produced conferences. He's built communities, lots of, lots of different stuff. Um, he so he's bringing his over a decade of experience thinking about how to best capture, distill, and communicate information to a new software platform that he's working on called Me. Uh, and so today he's going to be talking about some of the principles behind Me, how they got there, and then um, and whatever else he chooses to use his next twenty minutes to talk about. So um, thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Jess, for the the invitation. Um, let me share my screen and probably go here. So yeah, my, my background has a lot to do with uh, a couple of things. Um, the presentation industry um, in all sorts of areas, both uh, presenting, creating presentations, training speakers. Um, in graphic design, I, went, I ended up going towards more typography, layout, and things related to information architecture. And I'm a huge, huge fan of things related, um, you know, to stationary and, and physical products. Uh, also like card games. So I've always played a lot of card games, physical card games like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, Hearthstone, which is a digital card game. And I'm a huge, huge fan of index cards. So uh, I will be talking to you today uh, about me, which is this platform uh, we've been developing for quite a while. And it started um, some years ago, but me is a tool, a platform and a methodology, but today we're only gonna be talking about the tool part. 
of the plot um, of the the project and the name me comes from this guy called arthur me and let me put this here on the side and he created uh, a bunch of books more than 100 years ago and his most famous book is uh, an encyclopedia called the children's encyclopedia and he's the one that got me started um pretty much to to create you know this project to create this this company um when i read the first I, I stumbled upon the first edition of the book and i was reading the first pages and it totally resonated with me and he's kind of a forgotten figure not a lot of people uh, know about him they probably know about the children's encyclopedia if they're in the uk and in, in europe and in the US, it's it's called the Book of Knowledge, and it's also uh, an encyclopedia that was very influential. Um, I'm from Brazil, so uh, we also had a Brazilian version of his encyclopedia. It had a different name, and his name got lost when it came to Brazil. So it was kind of um, bringing, trying to find history and things related to to this. Um, so when I talk about this project, I'm going to talk about from. Uh, this journey uh, to rethink education. And, and um, before this project, I was involved in a lot of things related to education. And then eventually I learned that it wasn't about education that I wanted to you know, work with and research about. It was more about learning. And the way I see the difference between education and learning is very simple. Uh, education is when you go to a place and this place creates a curriculum uh, for you to learn. And learning is more based on your interest, more on serendipity, more on uh, finding things that you are interested about. So when you're the protagonist of you know, the things that you want to learn more about, we tend to think more about learning. And when, when you go to an institution you know, to acquire knowledge, that's more based on education. So this presentation is focused more on learning and more on you know, finding things yourself. Uh, and then I, I ended up taking another step back uh, because when we talk about learning and we talk about looking for information and finding information, um, we're not really talking about learning, we're talking about information. So if we manage to make information better, more accessible, better quality, and you know, make it even better um, to find and, and access and use, then um, automatically things related to learning and education will become better because you know the, the raw material that is information is uh, better to work with. Um, so this is where I'm coming from. Uh, and this is how I would like you to see uh, this project and how we are doing things. Uh, so it started between 2016 and 2017. Uh, I started compiling all my ideas after uh, I stumbled upon the book from Arthur Mee. And I put these things on the wall and I tried to organize you know, how things would come together, how things would uh, interconnect. And in this image, you can see there's, you know, there's categories, you know, uh, for the modules, the technologies, platforms, all sorts of things. And after a year, so I, I basically spent a year putting <laughs> this wall together and how things connected. And then I spent another year inviting people over uh, to my house to present them the ideas and, you know, go through them. So I've presented you know, the ideas for the project a bunch of times. And then over these presentations, people would raise questions. Oh, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? How would you solve this? How would you solve that? And then over this process of a year, you know, it got to a point where it was in a pretty good shape. And then after that, you know, we, we I ended up hiring um, a librarian. So a lot of the project is based on information sciences and libraries, uh, which is a little different than how people usually uh, tackle these challenges. But my main uh, idea is very simple. Um, libraries and librarians have existed for hundreds and hundreds of years, <laughs> a lot more than the internet, which is, uh, I think, 32 years old, if I, if I remember correctly. So there's a lot more knowledge and a lot more quality content based on uh, libraries and information sciences than I think there is on the web. And I started reading a bunch of uh, books from the past. You know, I, I stumbled upon Paul Tle, which is an, an incredible person. 
and all the work he's done, you know, precedes Vannevar Bush and a lot of other people that um, that uh, that ended up, ended up researching about this, right? So I feel like I tried to go back as much as I could to find the seeds of, of information and things related to that. And what I would like to show you is on, on this context, uh, you only understand something relative to something you already understand. And this quote is, the, is kind of the reason why we still use names like desktop and folder and trash bin, which are physical names um, for digital things. And the reason we do that, it's because it's easier to understand relative to something that you already understand. So this is how I'm going to begin uh, with a very quick demo showcasing how we normally search on the web, right? So let's say, for example, uh, I'm going to take uh, a series that I started watching on Netflix that I, I enjoyed quite a lot, and it's Anne with an E. So let's say, for example, somebody recommended to me this series, right? And I just began my journey right now looking for things related to this series. Uh, up to this moment, I only know that it's a series, right? I know it's a Netflix series called Anne with an E. So from here, I can end up finding different information. So I know it's a series. I, I know I have, you know, there's a bunch of links that I can click. I can maybe go to YouTube and, and look for the trailer for trailer uh, and with an E. And then I can maybe find some trailers here. I can go to Wikipedia, right? So this process of finding things on the web is a process of opening a bunch of tabs and and trying to find the information that we're looking for. And then maybe I stumble on the Wikipedia and then you know, I stumble upon uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery and I noticed that you know, she's the writer. And then as I go deeper and deeper on this rabbit hole, I get more and more tabs open of different, different, different platforms. So I can have you know, a tab open for Wikipedia, one for Flickr, one for YouTube, one for you know, all these different platforms. And the problem with this is that every single day, millions and millions of people all around the world are searching for the same exact things. So they go through this process of searching for the same kinds of information every single day, every single time. And I feel like that's a huge waste of energy and potential and uh, incremental of, you know, incremental knowledge. So basically at the end of all the effort that I put in researching about something, um, it goes down the drain, it goes to the trash. So if somebody else looks for N with an E um, tomorrow, they're going to start from scratch just as I did. And I know there's a benefit to the learning journey, but I feel there's a, even a, a bigger benefit to, um, to, a, cu to a curated um, environment of information. And this curated environment, it's not from one single person, it's more related to points of view. So if we take this example uh, with a point of view from a writer, they may compile information related to that point of view. And when we search, we find all these different things on the web. We can find text, we can find images, we can find videos, music, files, articles. You know, there's all sorts of different media types that we stumble upon when we search. And each of these is one or more tabs open. And that's quite troublesome <laughs> because it's, it's huge. Um, you don't know if something exists until you stumble upon it. So um, what I would like to show you is how we tend to think, uh, how we think about information when, we, when we're researching about things. So if I go back here, and I'm gonna show you this quick demo related to education. Uh, we tend to organize things in, um, in a modular fashion. Uh, so each rectangle you see on the screen is called a card and I can navigate up and down and I can navigate left and right. So this is a, a trail and these are cards and all these cards together form a board. So I have a board of content related to education in this example. 
And um, I don't know if you guys can see, but I'm using, I'm going to use a Logitech clicker. So this platform, I can, you know, I can press and hold, I can navigate to the right, to the left, and I can use this to organize information and to present information. Uh, so let's say, for example, you know, this trail right here is talking about uh, the teachers and the students. If I go to this card, I can make this card full screen and then I can navigate to the right or to the left. I can leave full screen mode and then I can go down a trail and navigate another trail. And each of these cards, we have different templates for the cards. And eventually we're gonna have a library of you know, hundreds of different templates for cards where each card has a specific purpose. So this card, for example, it's a calendar card where I have you know, the month, the, the, the day of the week, the weekday. I have the name of the event, the date, uh, inf uh, a little bit of information regarding this event and a little link to add to our calendar. And then if I go down another trail, I have video cards where I can just press play and watch these videos in, in the trail that I'm navigating through. So I can organize these cards in any way I choose. If, if it makes sense uh, on the structure that I want to present information, I can organize these cards in a specific way. And you can mix and match these cards in, in these trails. Um, but this specific example is just to showcase a bunch of different types of cards uh, so you can see the possibilities. And this trail has download files for, for a different uh, format. So you can download, download you know, PowerPoint uh, presentations, videos. You can download TXT files. Uh, another card template is a map card template. So you can have a curation of different uh, areas of the world in a different trail. And all of these cards are all in the same environment, uh, which is great because you can access this, uh, the information in a single place. But since in the web, everything is based on links, then you can click on any of these cards and you can go to a different web page uh, to access uh, other informations. So for example, in this trail, you can have a link for Google Calendar, a Google for Meet, uh, Google, you know, a link for all the different platforms that people use on the web. So this is the, the basic building blocks of um, how we do things. Uh, it's all based on cards, trails, and boards. And once you end up combining all of these elements, um, you have a system, a modular system that you can navigate through uh, to find what you're looking for. Um, and then all of these cards, they have a front side and they also have a back side. And this is the back part of the cards is where the magic happens. This is where you have all the metadata, you have all of the tag words, you can add different informations related to the content that you're showcasing. So if you have a photograph, for example, um, you can give the person a good experience of showcasing a high resolution photo in the front, and then in the back, you can put information regarded, uh, regarding where the photo was taken, who took the photo, the resolution, you know, the GPS location, um, the copyright uh, usage, and all of these things that are complementary to what you're seeing on the front, you can put behind uh, the card. And uh, on this, the, the card flip, like I mentioned, you find all of the information on the back and all of the card types will have uh, complementary information on the back. Uh, like I mentioned, cards can go full screen as well to get a better experience. And eventually we're gonna have a library of a, a bunch of different card templates that you can use uh, to enhance uh, your, your research. And the process of creating cards is very straightforward. Um, you select your media type, you can either upload from your computer, you can put a link from any website, you can put a direct link to, to maybe an image file on the web, uh, uh, depending, you know, of course, where it is hosted at. And eventually we, we're gonna have a browser plugin that you can compile things kind of how you do on Pinterest. So here's a quick demo on how we create cards. I'm gonna show you two different examples. The first one is here. Um, so let's say, for example, I wanna create an image card. Uh, this is our internal, uh, like this, this demo is, is very old. I'm gonna show you a newer one very soon. But the process is uh, selecting an image. And then once you select an image, you can choose to add a label and you can choose to add an image link. If I choose just the label, then it comes with the label. 
And then I can add another card here on the side and then add another image. And then if I choose not to add a label, then it just comes the image uh, directly. And then if I want to create another card, maybe a map card, I can go new post and then I can select the, maybe this area right here. And I can copy this and just paste it in here. And then I can either add a label for, uh, this is green gables and press done. And then the map is already embedded. So. Uh, as I start building this um, this board with different um, different cards, I can add you know maybe a, a YouTube link here to create a, a video card, and then you know it would work here directly. And then as I build this board of different uh, kinds of uh, of content, uh, it ends up being you know my curation or my point of view. But also, it's just a hub to center all, all of these different kinds of information in one specific place. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have uh, the navigation drawer, which is a very important part um, of the navigation and finding uh, things. Uh, it's, uh, it's on the left side, and it's to navigate faster if you have, for example, let's say 70 trails with like hundreds and hundreds of cards. Uh, you use the navigation drawer to find things faster. So this is where we filter and we sort and we navigate um, huge amounts of, of different cards. And when you filter, when you filter cards based on the type of content, then all the other cards that are not part of that category, they disappear. So if you select only photo, then only the cards that are photos, they stay on the board. So it's a very way to refine information and to reduce um, information overload. And then you can sort these as well by, you know, either ABC or from oldest to newest, you know, all of the, the ways that we're used to, to finding, even, you know, uh, meta tags and description. Um, that's where the, the, the text on the back of the cards um, come very in handy because when you search for information, if it's an image, you know, you, and you have text related to the image, then you're gonna be able to find it. And the table of contents, when you click, it just navigates quickly to where you want to go. Uh, it, it acts just like a book. And then, like I mentioned, filtering, when you select a type of card, then it filters out all the other cards. And then a quick demo of our internal alpha. Uh, I forgot to add my timer, but I think we should have yeah. a little bit more time. Rafael, you got about like one more minute and then we'll That's jump perfect. In. That's perfect. Um, this is our internal alpha right here. Uh, let me log in really quickly. And then after I log in, uh, I can create a new board. And then this is uh, what I showed you a little bit before was you know, mostly mockups, but here, this is the real deal. And then after I create a board, I start you know, propagating this board with different cards. And then I can add a trail, card, a trail here for maybe uh, cast members. And then I start adding these different cards with images. And then I can select images from my computer. And then they upload. And then I can add also a screen reader text here as well, which helps people to, to find. And then we're working on, on a markdown um, card. Uh, right now, it's very in early stages. Um, so you know I can add the markdown, and it works here. And then also for bookmarks, I can add links to different websites and it would just go to where it needs to go. If I get maybe this one, put a link here, add a title and that's it. And then once you save, you know, it, you, it just, you can end up navigating and accessing information. So that's what we're at right now. Um, we have a bunch of things working, but a lot of things still to be implemented. And I guess I want to close off saying that, you know, a tree starts as a seed and things usually take a long time to, uh, to finish developing. And this ended up being more of a lifetime endeavor uh, rather than just um, a simple project. So we're constantly working towards it. And Hopefully someday we can put it in the hands of everybody to try. Rafael is awesome. 
really, really gorgeous stuff. Um, cool. Well, we I mentioned this in the chat, but in case you're not reading the chat, um, this we are running a few minutes past our scheduled time. So if you need to drop off, feel free to. The recordings will be on YouTube. Um, I am going to give folks who are sticking around a few minutes to ask Raphael questions, uh, and then we'll wrap up. So if you have any questions for Raphael, now would be a good time to ask. Um, so this is a commercial company business model, uh, all on the web. T tell us more. When are you launching? Where do we go? Um, it's being built as a company. Uh, we do have a business model. Uh, it's the traditional monthly business model for regular users, for single users. Um, basically, we're going to have a free account where you, you know, you're going to have a limit of the number of cards and boards that you're going to have, limit of amount of, of storage. And then we're going to have you know, a, a paid plan that it's going to be pretty much unlimited, number of boards and cards you, you can create. Uh, hopefully, we plan to have also, you know, uh, um, a business, uh, a B2B model where we can implement this into different companies to, so, so, them they, so that they can use as an internal um, kind of in, interweb where they can, you know, add all of their, their content in these boards and access things faster. It's going to be great for managers, great for um, dealing with things inside. And our vision for the future is that we have, you know, public boards that work you know on the web with content from the web um, but that's still a long 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 ways uh, ahead <laughs> so i have to ask because we're interchange um formats standards exports so i sign up and your knowledge my knowledge is locked on your platform forever how do i get it out <laughs> So um, one of the main aspects of the platform is uh, connection to different platforms. So we're working a lot with different APIs. Um, so it's not going to be locked on our platform. I think we want to make something that is open and free for, for people to use. So for example, if you connect it with Notion, Notion's API, then you know your content is going to be on Notion. But you can have it uh, visually organized in a different way on our platform. Uh, and then that's kind of the way we're going with, but I don't have all of the questions, uh, all of the answers related to that uh, fixed, but I am a huge, huge fan of open source and creating uh, open knowledge and having information open to the world. I think the main thing really just is, um, I certainly at this point when I'm selecting tools, um, I need to know my exit path. So as an example, Rome has a JSON export. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't a standard. It's whatever the heck comes out of Rome. Um, yes. You know, other tools might have a markdown export or whatever. So I would encourage you to like, and literally just having a JSON export out of your API is probably the low bar um, of, of making me feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, with that. One thing we talked about is, um, for example, I could be able to export trails as a PDF file, maybe. Um, I could be able to export the whole board as, you know, as a structured uh, XML file that you, you'd be able to use anywhere else because it is pretty much a table <laughs> where you navigate X and Y. Uh, so there are a bunch of different ways um, that we can export uh, the content. Uh, we just haven't reached that part yet, but it will be an important part of it. <laughs> and I think the other thing that I see is, you know, I've literally just asked you for a new feature, but I would say like launch, launch, <laughs> launch. You've already too many features. You got it. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to ask my, my similar questions, Raphael, would be around like, what does it feel like to use it? Because as soon as I saw you clicking through it, I had all these questions of like, does it feel limiting to have only two dimensions? Like, and I can only go up, down, you know, like, can I zoom out? Can I jump link between cards? Like, how am I gonna, you know, navigate that in, in practice? Um, have you been using it personally, Raphael, to like organize your knowledge or what's been your experience so far? We've been using it internally um, in a limited way because as we develop these cards, we implement them and then we start using them. Um, but it feels incredible to use it and we're Im implementing different ways to get to things faster. So for example, if you have 10 cards in a trail, 
Uh, you want to jump to card number seven, you should be able to maybe touch seven on your keyboard and it will jump to card seven if you know exactly what card that is. Um, but we're also going to have, you know, quick navigation, you know, that quick menu, command K kind of thing. And then you type in what you want and then it'll jump directly to that card. Uh, you know, we're talking about cards being connected so that you change information on one card and then it updates in the other card. So you can have source and destination cards as well. Um, there's a, so many different ways of interacting with these things that it, when you go modular, the possibilities are endless pretty much. Cool. Other questions for Raphael? Well, good stuff, Raphael. I apologize that uh, your your talk went over the uh, the time bound for the meeting, and so a few people had to drop off. So That's fine. Ho hopefully, if people have questions, they can reach out to you directly. Um, Boris, did you want to wrap up the meeting with a couple of notes, and then we'll um, send everybody off? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks to Jess for doing all the heavy lifting of reaching out to organizers and so on. This is the first of the essentially community speaker series. Uh, being run as volunteers by myself and Jess and uh, Betty. Uh, Betty is Australia slash Asia time zone. Um, and we may also do um, uh, meetings on that schedule. Um, and uh, so basically Luma is your main link for everything. Uh, that's where you can sign up and, and, and uh, get notices of the upcoming events. Uh, if anyone else has a, a related events, um, we haven't tried this yet and we have to figure out things like moderation and other stuff like that, but it is uh, something where other people can in fact share events. So um, especially if tools are doing things or anything else, that's kind of what we want to build is collaboratively have a space where, where people can uh, uh, share this sorts of things. Um, if you signed up through Luma, you'll get an email with, uh, with links once we, once we have everything from everyone. A uh, few other things, there is a Discord. Uh, we have an, an empty YouTube set up. Um, there is a GitHub. We, we, I think that's probably where I'm going to export the, uh, the chat. Uh, so we have the raw logs of those things there. Um, and then generally like a call for speakers. Um, so all of these links are, are a little complicated. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is going to create some easier uh, links to redirect to all of these things. I just looked up domains and um, might pick something like toolsforthought.rocks or other stuff like that. If you also look at my Twitter handle, twitter.com slash bman, uh, I tweeted a link to this slide deck, uh, which has uh, all of the links embedded in it. Um, thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, I'm going to hit the stop recording button. <laughs>